Well, good morning and welcome to Woodland on this beautiful sunny morning. You know, on a normal Sunday morning, uh, non-virtual Sunday morning, our uh, lobby is a buzz with people greeting each other and uh, catching up on the week or seeing what's ahead in the week. And uh, as this became more apparent that uh, this virtual would be our new norm for a while, we said, how could we bring that lobby element into this virtual service? So we came up with a segment that some people have called wonderfully cheesy, and I would welcome you to the second edition of our checking in. All right, we're at the Youth Center here, ready to kick off Woodland's second edition of checking Check in. in. I'm so excited to go see some of our church families and help us all stay a little better connected. Uh, we are going to take a run out today on Highway C. Did you say run? Oh, well, it's so <laughs> beautiful out. I think I'm actually going to run this one, Brad. Really? Yeah. <laughs> all right, you Let's go for it. Let's do it. it. Yeah. Okay, I'm getting in the truck. <laughs> Feeling strong. Here we go. All right, Michael, how you doing? Oh, I'm feeling my quarantine five here. <laughs> here we go. Highway C. Woo! <laughs> how you doing, Michael? Oh, man. Sure glad to be making it to the lens here. All right, let's Start go check in on Dan and Jeannie. All right. Which door do you think we should use, Brad? Well, I've heard Jeannie say that back door guests are best, so let's try the back door. All right. Hey, Lens. Hey. Hey, Lens. Hey, how are you doing? Well, we're here to check in on you. How are you doing? Good to see you guys. You're doing good. Do you want to come in? You bet. That'd be All great. Right. Yeah, come on in. All right. Morning, Woodland. Good morning. One of the projects I've been working on is making cards. Cutting firewood for me. And one of the things I've learned about myself is I'm more of a people person than I thought. And I miss sports more than I thought I would. Yeah, the thing I like most about spring is um, no mosquitoes and thinking about camping season. And we have a verse for this time is Romans 15, 13. Right here behind us. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, thanks, Linz. It was great to see you. Yep, all good right, to see thank you, guys. you guys. Good to see you. Hey, Danny, how far is it to the Den Hart Dogs? It's about five miles. Oh, oh man, we better get running here. We better get running. Are you actually running? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> all right. Okay, see ya. <laughs> Hey, the den is this way, man. Come on this way. Let's go. Here's some basketball shooting. Oh, hey. The dead heart dogs. The dead yeah. heart dogs. <laughs> Playing pig out here. Oh. Oh. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Look at that guy's got hops. Hey guys! Hey, we're here to check in. How are you doing? Doing good. What's well. new with you guys? Wow. You well, know, we thought we'd go on a jog on a beautiful day <laughs> yep. today, so yeah. we made it all the way out here. We don't get very many visitors out here. Thanks for <laughs> yeah. coming in. Yeah. All right, can we chat? Let's sure. do it. Come on in. Yeah. All right, thanks. Favorite spring activity? What's yours, Larry? Oh, well, I like to get out into the woods and chop some dead brush and trees out of there before the bugs get here. Right. What I enjoy in spring is, is the end of the year school concerts and plays, and I really regret that we're not able to go to those this year. Mm, mm -hmm. And you like flowers. I do, and I'm looking forward to planting them and seeing the color green. Mm -hmm. In Ecclesiastes 3, we read, There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And I decided that I'd paraphrase a little bit and say that there's a time to go and a time to stay at home. And... I hope during this time that I'm having to stay at home, I'm learning to prioritize so that when I'm able to go, I've, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And I've learned just how important it is that we be able to do the things that we're gifted to do. Some people can't do that now. And that's just a reminder just how important that is. It is. All right. Well, we've got uh, a ways to go. Still going up to the Haddens. So uh, good chatting with you guys. Well, Thanks for having us. Thanks for coming. Say hi to the neighbors. <laughs> All right. Yeah, bet. We'll, we'll let you get back to your game of pig. All right. Okay. Thanks, All right. Guys. See you guys. All right. See ya. Here we go. <laughs> Woo! Oh, we finally made it here. All right. Nice job. To the Haddens. Looks like they're uh, getting ready to go camping here. Let's see if they're. Oh yeah. They're they're around. Hello. Hey, there's Don. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, you finally made it. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, we loved yesterday. <laughs> oh, that would explain why Michael's got such a sweat workout. <laughs> yeah. All right. Water you want perfect. some water? Great. All right. 
Why don't you join us at the picnic table here? We'll do a little social distancing. All right, thanks. All we right. just want to check in, see you guys are doing. All right. Hello, Woodland family from the Haddens. We miss you guys and hope you're having a good spring. A springtime activity that we enjoy doing is fishing for sucker fish with a net. One thing we have learned is to be creative while communicating with friends and family. And one spring project we've been working on is transplanting apple trees. We've also been cutting each other's hair. And mine seems to have gotten blue and shorter than what I've hoped. But that's the fun of this crazy season. We hope you have a great week. Bye. Bye. Thank you for checking in. All right, bye, Hens. See you, Hens. Have a good right. one. Great to see you. All right, well, this concludes the second edition of Woodlands Checking Checkin In. in. Hey, it's been great seeing some folks this week and, and, and seeing different faces. We've really enjoyed it. And Anita, your hair looks great. Oh yeah, you bet. <laughs> Looking good. Donnie did a great job there. Um, so yeah, we, we've really enjoyed this. We miss you all. Uh, we hope that uh, we can get back together soon, very, very soon. soon, right? And uh, But this concludes the second week of it. So. All right, you ready to run back, Michael? No, I'm done. Let's get in the truck. <laughs> Here we are again. For the record, we like flowers too, Karen. This is our choice again this week to worship together. We're gonna make that choice just like we would do if we were in person. We're gonna choose to get our devices, our computers, our cell phones, our tablets, and we're going to dance around our houses. We're gonna worship the Lord together because there's hope within the fight. I can see the promised land, though there's pain within the plan. There is victory in the end. Your love is my battle cry when my fears like Jericho fill their walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown. Your love is my battle cry. Thank you, God. The anthem for all my life. Here's our proclamation. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every chain of the past you've broken into. Over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth that nothing is. The shadows steal the light. Your love is my battle cry. The anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall. The mountains will move. Every chain of the past you've broken and sealed. Over fear, over lies. We're singing the truth.
curtains will move every chain of the past you've broken into over fear over lies we're singing the truth and nothing is impossible This morning we are going back into Luke and going to be uh, reading uh, the, the account of two gentlemen on the road to Emmaus. And so uh, in this story we see that there is a uh, resurrection and that the resurrection life of Jesus can be transformative, is transformative to those who see it, who get it. Um, and it's interesting as I was considering this that this transformation, the redemption that's found in God is not a new thing found in scriptures but it's actually seen throughout scriptures. The prophets of old were looking forward to a day where God would bring about something new and, and bring about restoration. Listen to the hopeful words of Isaiah 43, where Isaiah writes, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And so today, especially, as, as we look around outside, outside our windows and see new life springing forth, it reminds us of the power of God to bring about transformation and that there is resurrection, that he brings about new things into our world and into our lives. And on this side of the cross, we can apply that to our lives. The Apostle Paul um, looked back on the cross and, and, and knew that it brought transformation and experienced that transformation. Um, look how he, he writes of, of the resurrection and its power in our lives in 2 Corinthians five seventeen, where he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so that is what we want to pray for in our lives, in the world around us, that God would bring about transformation restoration, and that his resurrection would do a great work in our lives. So let's go ahead and ask the Lord to open our eyes and our hearts and, and, and just ask him for that today. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are all about changing things for your glory. Lord, you take what is dead and bring life to it. You take what is dark and gloomy and bring something glorious out of it. Lord, you take what is confusing, what, 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 what is hopeless, and bring purpose and bring light and bring, bring something amazing through it. Lord, you are all about transforming people into your image. You're about transforming our lives so that we, we can reflect you and we can live to glorify you instead of living in rebellion against you, Lord. We just ask that, like these men, that you would open our eyes to you, that we would see you at work at work in our lives, and that we would be transformed through the resurrection power of your spirit, Lord, today, starting today even, um, and, and throughout our, all of our lives. Lord, we just ask that you would just uh, bring, bring change, and, and, and may we be hopeful that you have the ultimate victory in your hands, that everything is wrapped inside of your character and who you are, and that you are holding us together. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, just, just give us peace today, and may your transformative power be at work in our lives and those around us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again, Michael. So uh, our family, we've been trying to take a walk daily. Uh, and it doesn't always work because April showers happen. Uh, but I wonder if, if you were taking a walk and... Jesus just kind of saddled up next to you there and was walking along with you, would you recognize him? Would I recognize him? These guys, they were kept from re recognizing him. They didn't, they didn't recognize his physical face that they had probably seen all over the tabloids, you know. 
uh, but they also didn't recognize that greater something, that underneath, that, that majesty from on high. They didn't, they didn't see it they, until, until he revealed to them the scriptures and, and then boom, there he was. As we worship, as we get ready to get back into this story, this wild, crazy, exciting story, let's try to uncover some of the, the, that glory that is Jesus. Uh, so in these words and, and in, this, in this melody, let's pull out what we know and what we can find of Jesus. Matt, would you lead us in this song here? Here's the chorus. These are scattered beams. You are the bright sun. These are shallow streams. You are the ocean. These are just shadows. And you are the substance. We are thirsty, we are dry. Only you can satisfy. You are the ocean. star-painted heavens who could deny your glory God the mountains that rise the sea as it breaks this world full of life it's all just a taste these are scattered beams you are the bride shallow streams you are the ocean these are just shadows and you are the substance we are thirsty we're dry only Who could deny? 
all the way my Savior leads me. Who have I to ask beside? How could I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide? All the way my Savior leads me. And cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial. Feeds me with the living bread. You lead me and keep me from falling. You carry me close to your heart and show. my song through endless ages. Jesus led me all the Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow with ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite with I withhold. 
Take my intellect and use every power as you choose. Here am I. Well, good morning, dear ones. It's wonderful to be seen by you again, and I, I hope that, especially on the latter part of this week, you have gotten outside and enjoyed God's world. We're doing that at home. Uh, we have added 10,000 new pets over the last couple of weeks, and they come in the form of a hive full of bees that we're watching and we're enjoying learning all about how bees work in God's world. And also, like the Haddons, we've added sucker fishing to our resume. Uh, we went out actually with the Haddons, and I uh, took one dip, caught two fish, and then promptly fell into the stream and went into retirement right there. So I can add that to my redneck resume. I am a sucker fisher uh, but now in retirement. These are great things uh, to enjoy in God's world, and I hope that you're getting out and finding encouragement as the Lord provides us that encouragement through His world. Uh, this is also still a hard time. We, we do that in the Christian life. We live in tension. We live in the beauty of God's world while at the same time going through difficult things. And uh, I want you to know that your elder team continues to meet regularly. Uh, we are now beginning to talk about the mechanics of regathering. There's been no decision made about when that will take place. We want our team leaders here at Woodland to go uh, into, into play, into action, and thinking about how this is going to work. Uh, but we're beginning to talk about that. Uh, at the same time, we realize that uh, people are struggling right now. In particular, people are struggling with social isolation, uh, purpose in life as they wonder how, as you wonder, as I wonder, how do we go about the work that God has given us to, to do? And there's also financial stress. And, and as we talk about these things, as we pray about these things, 
Uh, we want to go to Scripture, and I'm really, really excited that we get to go into Luke 24 today. Uh, this passage that we're going to look at together speaks to our ultimate purpose and place with God provided by the resurrection of Jesus. This is where we need to be today as we struggle in our lives, as we wonder about purpose, as we feel stress. We need to think about the resurrection life of Jesus, all one for us by the work of Jesus at the cross. Our passage today is Luke 24. We're going to start in verse 13, going all the way to verse 35. This passage comes right after the passage that we looked at on Easter Sunday morning, three weeks ago, the beginning of Luke 24. And in that passage, we start with despondency, maybe a little bit like the beginning of this week for some of us. Uh, they were despondent. Jesus has died. He has been, he's been buried, and the women go to anoint Jesus, and they're, they're depressed, and they're sad, and yet... Those short 12 verses at the beginning of Luke 24, they end with the discovery of the empty tomb. Jesus is alive. There is resurrection life because of the work of Jesus. And yet, nobody has seen Jesus, not at least in Luke's account, the way he sets this up. Luke is writing for us a cliffhanger. Where is Jesus? And he, of course, is going to reveal himself in his resurrection body at different times, and we get to go into those passages today. Before we do that, let's ask God to bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Father, we thank you that you have revealed Jesus to us. We get to read about him in your word. Your spirit meets us here as we come to you in your word wanting to know more about the resurrection life of Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for all that you did at the cross. We thank you for your resurrection power at work at the, in the tomb. And we thank you for your resurrection power at work in us when we, by faith, receive your good work. Help us today to have our eyes open as we read about your work and we read about you and your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to read this passage together. This is Luke 24, 13 to 35, and then we're going to talk about it together. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, the man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since all these things happened. Or ever, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses... And all the prophets he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, 
and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the Scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them at the breaking of the bread. On the surface, this passage is about two men who go for a walk, returning to their village of Emmaus. It's about a walk, about a conversation, about a meal, and about a community. But, but like every passage in Luke and, and in the Scriptures, this passage has a lot of layers to it. It's also about the resurrection life and what resurrection does, and how Jesus reveals himself to us even today, and how we find purpose and place with God. Let's walk through the account together. Verses 13 to 16 start off with a walk where Jesus is unrecognized. Two guys, two followers of Jesus are returning home to their village of Emmaus. Now, we don't know anything about this village. The best guess is that it was the ancient village of Mosra, not around today. Uh, and the obscurity of the village uh, speaks to the authenticity of the passage. If you were to make up this passage, you would at least put in a village that everybody had heard of. Emmaus was not an important place. Mosra, if that is the place, was 3.5 miles from Jerusalem. Uh, it was pretty typical to put in distances in round numbers. In other words, the seven miles is a there and back again distance. And so they're, they're perhaps 3.5 miles from Jerusalem. That's the distance that a good runner could run in, say, 20 minutes. And you could certainly walk that distance in a couple of hours. And these men are returning home after the events of Sunday. And they are talking about Jesus. They're not only talking about Jesus, but they're discussing him. Uh, the word is homileo, the word from which we get our word homily. It's an intense discussion. They're each posing their theories about what has happened and what the women have said and what the disciples have said and what people have seen and how they haven't seen Jesus, they're attempting to reconcile their worldviews to what has happened, and yet they're skeptical. Suddenly, Jesus appears. He's just there. He's now with them. He joins them, and yet, this is fascinating, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I've read various accounts, and many of them quite cockamamie, actually, about how they might not have recognized Jesus. One account said, well, it was a dusty road. It's like, is that you, Jesus? And they can barely see their hands in front of their faces. These are ridiculous theories about how they didn't recognize Jesus. The truth is that there is something about resurrection life that fallen people can't get on their own. Something about being in our pre-resurrection state as fallen people that keeps us from seeing what the resurrection provides in Jesus. Think of Mary Magdalene in John's account, chapter 20. Mary at the tomb, she loved Jesus. She was looking for Jesus. She was thinking of nothing but Jesus, and she met him, and she didn't recognize him. Or in the very next chapter in John's gospel, the disciples saw Jesus on the lake, and they were 
thinking all about Jesus, and yet they didn't recognize him. I'm reminded of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, where Paul writes, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We need help to recognize and embrace the risen Savior. You know, people start off with all kinds of pictures of Jesus. And that's one of the things I like about this passage. It walks us through how we come to know the resurrection. Lord, none of us start off with a clear picture of who Jesus is. Some people view Jesus as a historical figure and they're not sure how he relates to anything. Other people regard Jesus as a religious figure and they don't understand You know, what he's all about. Maybe he's kind of like Buddha or somebody that we don't really get. Other people view Jesus as an idea. And the idea has something to do with, well, maybe I need to be a better person. And Jesus has something to do with that. Or some people regard Jesus as a real person that others have used to manipulate them, to make them do stuff that they don't want to do. And yet, none of us starts off recognizing Jesus for who he is, we need help, even as these men needed help to recognize Jesus. That's the walk, Jesus unrecognized. Then we move next to the conversation. This is by far the longest part of the passage. This is where Jesus is revealed in Scripture. And there's a kind of Q&A here. Two exchanges, and Jesus is going to, is going to provide some, some information here that the men certainly need, though they're going to need more than that. Jesus asks the question, what are you talking about? Like he doesn't know. Of course he knows, but he wants to hear from them. Notice at first the men, they stood still looking sad. There's a, there's a pause here, an emotional pause where the men just can't even respond at first because they are overwhelmed. They are disappointed in their purpose. They had walked with Jesus. They had had hoped that he would be something that that now they think maybe he isn't. They're disillusioned about God's plan and their proper place with God. Finally, one of the men, we now get a name. His name is Cleopas. He says, are you the only one? who doesn't know what's going on. Isn't this fascinating? Jesus actually is the only one who knows what's going on. Nobody else knows what's going on. Cleopas is diametrically wrong in his question, but he's, he's, he's blown away by it. Who are you that you don't know what is going on or what these things are all about? Here's the second exchange. Jesus answers, what things? Jesus is going to draw them out a little bit further. And then Cleopas just explodes. Jesus of Nazareth. He's a prophet, mighty in deed and word. He was killed by the chief priests and rulers, and we'd hoped he might be the one to redeem Israel. And it's now been three days since Jesus is killed, but it's not, it's not over yet because now these, the, the, the women of our company whom we trusted They went to the tomb and they come back with this crazy story about an angel who talks about how Jesus is alive. And so his followers, Peter, James, John, they went and checked it out. And they didn't find Jesus, but they didn't find him dead either. And now everything points to Jesus being alive, but we we haven't seen him. Let's pause for a minute and think about what Cleopas' picture of Jesus is. He's describing Jesus as though he were, and he is, another Moses. This language here of mighty and word and deed, this is, this is Moses. Remember who Moses was? He was the deliverer of Israel at the inception of the, the nation. But then think again of who of what Moses said, Deuteronomy 18, Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. 
Cleopas and his companion are not wrong about Jesus, but Jesus is far more than another Moses who will deliver the nation of Israel. Jesus is the deliverer of all people in God's plan. He hasn't yet grasped fully who Jesus is, and now he's confused, and he's perplexed, and he's disillusioned. Notice Jesus' response here. Verses 25, 26, 27. These are the most important verses in the passage. Jesus responds with great compassion. Oh, you foolish ones. Slow of heart to believe what the prophets have told you. Jesus is talking to his followers here. (laughs) These are not his enemies, and yet they don't fully get who he is and what has, has happened You have the facts, my loved ones, but you're missing something. Verse 26, there's suffering before glory. You're missing the cross. You're missing the facts spoken about in all the scriptures that before I enter into glory, before I enter into resurrection life, I have to go through suffering. This is what's been talked about in Psalm 2, 16, 31, 69, 110, 118, Isaiah 53. I've I've talked about this in my ministry in chapters 9 and chapter 18. And as we've studied Luke, we've seen Jesus tell his disciples again and again that before I go into glory, the Son of Man has to suffer and be killed. And then we always get a little tag verse after those announcements of Jesus' cross, which go like this, this one from chapter 18, but they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them. There's that language again. And they did not grasp what was said. And then Jesus goes on, verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus goes back all the way to what we would call Genesis, and he goes through all the scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament, and he points to all the references that that describe him, and he interprets how the scriptures work and how they all point to his cross and how there is suffering before glory. This is the first gospel presentation. Can you imagine hearing it from Jesus himself? talking about his own death and resurrection and how everything God is doing in his world is done through Jesus for the benefit of his people. About how he, Jesus, absorbed the injustice of our sin against God and how we can know him by faith in him, spoken by Jesus himself. You know, we need to learn about Jesus in the Bible, and and understand him by focusing on the cross. The cross is not an accident. The cross isn't something that just happened to Jesus. The cross is, well, it has everything to do with Jesus' mission as he entered into his own world, took our sins on himself, and paid that debt uh, to the Father so that we could have resurrection life in Jesus, and we need to spend time in God's Word and get to know Jesus, not losing sight of His cross. There is suffering before glory. Crazy thing in the passage, that the men still don't recognize Him. They, they, they've now heard the scriptures, they have the content, they have the information, they are waiting, though they don't realize it, for Jesus to provide something else for them to help them understand who he is. That's the conversation. Jesus revealed in the scriptures. We come now to the meal Here is where Jesus is recognized in relationship to these men. They apparently arrive at Emmaus, okay? Three and a half miles is not far enough 
when you're walking with Jesus, but they're suddenly there. It looks like Jesus is going to go further. They say, no, 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 come, Jesus. Come and reside with us. Stay at our house. And they share a meal with Jesus where they break bread together. This looks like the institution of the Lord's table that Jesus had inaugurated the night before his death. And what we're going to do here at Woodland again sometime very soon when we are regathered. It looks like that meal, but I don't think it is. Neither is it a mystical thing that Jesus is doing here. I think they're just sharing a, a common meal together in relationship to Jesus. But as they're doing this, their eyes are opened. This word is used two other times in this very passage to talk about how after the men's eyes were opened, the scriptures were opened to them. In the book of Acts, chapter 16, Luke will use this word to talk about how people's hearts are opened by the Spirit of God. What has happened here is that Jesus has simply revealed himself to the men in Scripture, it's not apart from Scripture. Even Jesus opens up the Word to them. But as they're talking about Scripture, Jesus reveals Himself in relationship to the men in conjunction with Scripture. And suddenly they recognize who Jesus is and they get it that He had to suffer before He was glorified. And then Jesus disappears. He has revealed himself. His purpose in this encounter is complete. In the same way, we need to have our eyes opened in relationship to Jesus. Just as Jesus opened the eyes of these men, and this passage is very unique because Jesus wasn't Actually, glorified yet, he hadn't returned to the Father. He's meeting these men face to face. We need to have our eyes opened in the same way. Today, the way God does this is through his Spirit, who in conjunction with God's Word, never apart from God's Word, but in conjunction with the Gospel, opens our eyes so we can recognize Jesus. Jesus talked about this in, in John 14, verse 26. Jesus had said during his earthly ministry, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It's going to be the Spirit's job, as you read my word, to open your eyes so that you can respond in faith. Later, Paul will write, 1 Corinthians 2.12, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. This calling by the Spirit of God, this calling to Jesus takes place entirely by God's grace as we hear God's Word, as He opens the Gospel to us, and, and then we respond to Jesus by faith. These spiritual things include who Jesus is, the importance of the cross, uh, our purpose in life, our new place with God, God's purpose in the suffering of Jesus and God's purpose in our suffering. All of this comes through the resurrection life that we have in Jesus when we respond to him by faith. Now at this point, the passage could end. I think that's a pretty good message. I can live on that. But notice that the passage doesn't end. We have a few verses after this, verses 33, 34, 35, that talk about a community where Jesus is revered by others. The two men, right away, they return to Jerusalem, three and a half miles. They could have been good runners. They get back to Jerusalem, 
and they're greeted by the 11 disciples. And before they can tell them anything about their encounter with Jesus, the, the, the 11 and those with them, they, they, they respond, the Lord is risen indeed and he has appeared to Peter. We don't have that account in the Gospels with uh, the account of G- the Lord's meeting with Peter, but Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. And, and everybody is abuzz with their different encounters with the risen Christ. And finally, they get to share their story. Notice what God has done. He has provided a community for these men. And, and now they will share their experiences of the risen Christ together. And this, these experiences include seeing the Lord. And they're going to proclaim the gospel together. And they're going to study together. And they're going to be transformed by the Spirit together. And they're going to share resurrection life together. And they're going to share their renewed purpose in God's plan. And they're going to enjoy their renewed place with God. And they're going to share suffering before glory together. You know, when we trust in Jesus by faith, we receive a new community Together, This includes the worldwide church of God. Everybody who's trusting in Jesus around the world, uh, sometimes called the church universal. But it also includes local bodies of believers that we gather with as our church families, places like Woodland. And we share resurrection life with each other. This begins spiritually when we trust in Jesus by faith and it someday will be completed when we are with Jesus and our bodies are, are, are raised so that we also have resurrection bodies like Jesus does. In the meantime, we discover God's purpose and we discover our place with God. And this includes our suffering that takes place before we are glorified and we're, we are with Jesus. Jesus is finished with his suffering, but you know what? We aren't. We get to suffer, frankly, with other people. We go through tough stuff like the coronavirus crisis, and, and, and we, 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 we hurt for each other, and we include each other in the hope that we have, and we bring each other along, and this is God's way of preparing us to be with him. I've been thinking this week about Colossians 1 24. It's an important verse for our place in time. Paul writes this. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body that is the church. You know, one of the reasons that we struggle is that, yeah, there's something about us that just doesn't want to suffer. We don't want that to be part of our experience. We would rather just kind of close our eyes and stay home and sort of let the coronavirus thing go by and then we can go back to being happy and doing all the stuff that we want to do. Let's not do that. Let's let's take this time in our church family's history. Let's take this opportunity to learn more about our ultimate purpose and place with God provided by the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus. There is nothing that we go through as our church family that is outside of God's plan. In fact, I would be so bold as to say that the coronavirus crisis is all about God preparing his people to be with Jesus. And I can say that because everything that God does in his world is about preparing the church to be with him. And that's an encouraging thought this week as we're maybe discouraged at certain points. We can think about the resurrection life that we have in Jesus and we can be encouraged in our purpose and our place with him. Resurrection life restores our purpose and place in Jesus. Father, we thank you for the encouragement of this passage. The men started off dismayed and they ended up exultant. Because they had met the risen Lord. Their eyes had been opened. They had to understand that you, Jesus, had to suffer first, then be glorified. And in the same way, they're going to go through hardship, but then they're going to be with you, Jesus. And in between, they learned about their purpose in this life. 
and they learn about their new place as your children. We have the same need, Lord, here at Woodland. We have the same need to remember that nothing that is going on is outside of your purpose and your plan. And we need to think about your son, Jesus, and, and remember that he has bought us and he's bringing us to you. And he's going to use this time to make us holy, even as we enjoy resurrection life now that involves a new purpose and a new plan, and as we look forward to being with you. We pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. That's a lot to celebrate. And the wise who understand what has just been taught need get up and dance <laughs> to celebrate what God has done for us. So whatever you're doing right now, stop. Get up off the couch. Get up off the floor and start dancing with us. And luckily, this song has got motions built into it, starting with the, the, ex the exclamation, oh, all right? So, oh, 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 oh. Resurrection day and nothing's gonna hold me in the grave. This is my resurrection day and nothing's gonna hold me down. Say goodbye to my yesterdays. Ever since I met you, I am changed. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. Say goodbye to my yesterdays Ever since I met you, I am changed This is my resurrection day And nothing's gonna hold me down The good news is the good news Cause you chose the rugged cross The good news is the good news Cause you rose up from the dust The gospel is the power That is saving all of us So I can get up on the floor Ever since I met you, I am changed. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me in the grave. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. Say goodbye to my yesterdays. Ever since I met you, I am changed. This is my resurrection day. Nothing's gonna hold me down. You couldn't see it, but Brad and Michael and I were dancing. We were dancing because we have a purpose and a place with God, and we're so happy. And we hope that you were dancing too, and in fact, it, in some way or another, you dance all week because we have resurrection life in Christ when we trust in Him. We want to close our service today with Paul's benediction from the book of 2 Thessalonians. Now, now may the Lord of peace Himself... Give you peace at all times in every way, 
The Lord be with you all. That's a wonderful word to live on. And may the Lord be with you all. We know that he is because of his resurrection power that is at work in us through faith in him. And may you have a wonderful week. May you go out into God's world and and enjoy what he provides. And may you grow in faith in Jesus as your eyes are opened in the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Have a great week in the Lord.